Welcome, Savvy Seeker, to the Spiritual Phoenix Podcast. This is your audio oasis and paranormal portal. You can experience legendary guests, thought-provoking tarot readings, astonishing astrological forecasts, and exposure to ideas intent on igniting your unlimited inspiration. Subscribe today to keep your fire burning. One last thing, you are encouraged to reach out and ask questions. Become a part of the show. Now please enjoy today's episode. Welcome back, everybody. We are joined again with Stephanie Capone. Stephanie, how are you doing? I'm great, Ross. How are you doing today? After that like brain fart that I had before we started recording, or besides that, I'm, I'm doing really well, thank you. Um, so can you explain to everyone listening what exactly we are doing, and me as well? <laughs> Um, so Ross and I got together to go through the tarot and we're doing the fool's guide to tarot. So thank you so much for sticking with us and listening every week. We really appreciate it. We're having a blast. Um, each week we go through and we talk about one major arcana card and then we talk about its corresponding, um, minors. Hmm. And, uh, last week we talked about the emperor and the fours. Yeah, that was a really fun episode, and I, I really got a lot from it. Um, I'm excited to talk about the Hierophant. What is something that you want to bring up about the Hierophant right out of the gate? Like, where should we start? Um, you know, it's an interesting card that has changed and evolved for me over the years exponentially. Um, if you look at a traditional Rider Waite Smith, it's, um, and I think in even earlier decks, it was called the Pope. Hmm. And I went to Catholic school my whole life. So this is a very triggering card of um, basically like that Catholic and religious doctrine that when whoever is in charge is speaking to you, it is, they are infallible and you just blindly listen. Hmm. And, lead. and that's how I always took that card until I really started studying tarot. And I realized that um, there's so much more to this card. Yeah, I definitely, uh, looking at it now, I picked up some some new things about it as well even. It's interesting how dense the information is in some of this and like how packed it really is. What are some of the new things that you've come to the conclusion of about this card? Well, without disrespecting all of the the heavy density um, of symbolism in it, I really, for me, I tried to simplify it into something that spoke to me. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the Moon Void Tarot, I'm trying to, sorry, there's a glare on it, but it's um, a stack of books with like a, almost a crystal ball sitting on top of it or a glowing orb and the moon phase is going around it. Okay. And so I feel like there's, there's a, the implications of tradition and teaching and learning. Hmm. And so from my understanding of the card and its personal meaning to me is that we're all free to choose our own path and to break from tradition that maybe we learned from our families and seek the knowledge that feels aligned to our personal truth. Hmm. And then once, you know, you take that course of study, whatever way that is, along the way, you meet people that you are constantly learning from. And in the same time, it's, that's why there's the circle, because it's, an, it's a constant circular loop of learning and then sharing. Hmm. So our, our path of knowledge never ends. I really, really like your explanation, and I really like the card um, given the explanation. And my understanding of the Hierophant uh, is kind of this doctor of the soul or teacher of the soul, and it actually really ties up with yours really well in the sense, especially the cyclical element of it, because when you really dive into the concept, um, what you're representing, like the moon cycle or the moon phases, is like one of the oldest teachers of the soul. It's like one of the oldest symbols of um, the kind of the cycles of life. So 
that on like that scale is awesome. But then when you bring it into like the macro scale of everything is stepping out of this figure being the teacher of the soul and bringing it back to the primal, like basic concept of how we got a lot of this wisdom, which was through observation of the universe, like through our senses. And it really uh, underlines this sense that we're returning to this original phase of perception in the modern world and simplifying it down and getting out of all the complex symbolism of the card and getting it down to its barest um, primal raw essence. Yes, I could not agree with you more. Yeah, I think that's absolutely in line with um, what I was saying as well. Um, kind of nobody's going to believe exactly the same things. Mm -hmm. Even when we're, um, you know, we're both, we're two diff very different people that have chosen the same course of study with tarot, and we both see things in our own special, unique way because of how we view the world. So kind of how I look at um, the Hierophant is um, how we used to view religion and spirituality is outside of ourselves. Like we got that from, from books and we got it from listening to people that we put up on a pedestal. And this is really about each person finding their own path and, hmm. finding, you know, the teacher within themselves. Yeah, I, I certainly, uh, I would agree with that in the sense, looking at the symbolism of the card, this is something that came to me this time looking at it too. So it's the five and you have his head and his two hands, which are kind of like the top of the pentacle. And then these two part, uh, these two people down here are kind of like the legs of the pentacle. If yeah. you look at it and it's really kind of like um, channeling these concepts from above and then instilling them into the material especially like into the material world like being this taking this big big concept and then reducing it down to these two material perceptions um and i've never perceived it that way and in my understanding the pinnacle is supposed to represent man in some sense as well correct where it's like the point is the head the two uh, top pieces are like arms and the two bottom pieces are legs. So it's kind of like saying, channeling this divine wisdom into one person. Right. Yes, I completely agree with you. You know, in on a traditional, and I'm not going to go into like all of the symbolism, but just like the the keys at the bottom, the, the two keys that are crossed mm -hmm. are supposed to symbolize heaven and earth. Hmm. And so when you've got this, like the, that papal figure that they're the ones that are that like channel that brings heaven down to earth, which we saw in the magician when we realized, you know what, that's us. Mm -hmm. We're the divine channel. So in the Hierophant, you are the divine channel. I'm the divine channel. And we are capable of taking all of this knowledge out of, you know, out of the ethers and then bringing it to the material plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's super important. Like you don't need a middleman. Middleman is, is maybe it can help you find the path, but it's not necessary. You have all of the keys um, within you already inherently. Right. Um, I think that the five is interesting because the five is, is that like change. Hmm. Um, and it's in that in the tradition of this card when it meets the five that's the change that's when you say okay i can take what i've always done and i can question why why hmm. why do we why do i have to put on a fucking frilly white dress on easter sunday and go to church mm -hmm. you know why do we have you know easter eggs that we go for a hunt and then my mom cuts them up and makes deviled eggs for and we eat ham for easter sunday like what you know you don't think about like people don't question and like this is a card of questioning tradition and then having the courage to break from it and go your own path yeah it's kind of like why do we do what we do and i, I guess starting with that why question, are you ready to move into the symbols or do you have more that you want to add or the, uh, the minors, or do you have more you want to add to the, the major? 
Um, I think I'm ready to move into the minors. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to start with the five of cups, especially since you presented it as kind of a why. And for me, like filtering it through the question of why with the five of cups is it's this individual looking at why are my emotions all over the place? Why am I spilling them? Like taking responsibility and really looking at their actions and being like, why do I keep getting these results? Um, and really looking at it. Does that make sense for you? Like with five of cups? Um, I definitely think that that's a big part of it. Um, so fives are about like that asking why and then moving. So in the five of cups, you have the choice hmm. to stand there and look at the, the three that are tipped over or turn the fuck around and look at the two that are standing up behind you. You don't just have one, there's two, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like this is a big card about, um, accepting mm. the past and moving on, um, it's, you know, like people like are very triggered when they see this card. They're triggered by their heartbreak. They're immediately brought right to the past. But there's so much hope in this card. And they're, how you see a situation is always completely 1000% your control. Hmm. You know, if you can't, you can't change something, but you can always change the way you look at it. You can always change how you feel about it. Mm -hmm. so this would be changing how you feel about it. Um, it's in interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say, it's interesting how you bring up kind of um, getting over it or, or like moving past it. Cause there's literally the bridge there over the water. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have this. So green's the color of the heart chakra. So it's your heart creating this connecting to this bridge, which gets you to the other side of your heart. And it kind of helps you get over these turbulent emotions if you're willing to. Um, I really like the fact of how you kind of outlined that so I could get like, there's a deeper understanding of it. Thank hmm. you. That's all I had to add though. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. Um, I was just going to say in the, in the moon void tarot, it's just, it's the same concept, just a modern scene. It's in a kitchen and there are three broken coffee cups on the floor with spilled coffee. And then on the counter, there's one that's just tipped over. It's like, spilled but there's still stuff in it and the cup's not broken and then just off to the just out of almost out of view is is the complete right side up cup hmm. and you know a lot of times when we're going through our healing journey it's really hard to look away from the mess or to even know where to begin how to clean it up hmm. and i feel like this is about like there's all those broken pieces because um, I think it's it's the cleanup and you don't necessarily have to put it back together because you still have two totally upright cups. Mm -hmm. um, realizing that you don't need the ones that are broken anymore. It's okay to like kind of honor the past and honor your struggle and honor your emotions and choose differently. Yeah, that, there's a lot of wisdom in there. One thing I want to say, I, first off, I like the artwork. I like the blanket statement for every card that you're going to show me is I like the artwork. Um, yeah, <laughs> Thank the, you so much. <laughs> you're welcome. The other aspect of it is, though, that card hit home more for me because, like, spilling coffee is is a travesty, um, and I might need time to mourn the spilt coffee in your card. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. There's There's plenty more coffee. No, but it's, I'm just joking. Wait till you uh, get to the six of cups. There's tons of coffee. Wonderful. I'm all about the coffee. Uh, I, I really like the way that you uh, present it. Thank you. Ah, oh, you're welcome. What five do you want to switch to now? Uh, let's talk about the five of swords. All right. What comes up for you on that? So, Let's start with the Moon Void Tarot on this one, actually, too, if oh, that's okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so on the Moon Void Tarot, there's a little bird on the ground. Aww. A lot of little, a little, a lot of little dagger, little bloody daggers all around it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so the bird's not dead, but the bird is like wounded and hurt. Hmm. And the swords aren't sticking in the bird. The the swords are all about it. So it's like 
they were just poked. Hmm. So I feel like this is, um, and the bird can be you and the bird can be something else. The bird can be a situation. It can represent a difficult conversation or a fight. It can be somebody else that you're upset with. But um, I feel like it's really a reminder that uh, our words carry weight. Hmm. Um, and how also the way we think about things, it's, it's a vicious cycle of like wounding and hurting and um, taking things really personally and being very sen like overly sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going back to like looking at that, it kind of, to me speaks to um, the concept that our thoughts about situations hurt us more than the situations themselves. And it kind of ties into the uh, whole perception. What we focus on is kind of what we magnify. So when we focus on these, these uh, injuries done to us or the objects of our injury, the more we're kind of going to see that and the less we might see some uh, positive element from it, I guess. You know, um, definitely. I think too, a lot is a lot in this card is um, taking accountability and responsibility hmm. for um, what happens, like the aftermath of when we feel like we need to be right. Hmm. You know, sometimes we go to really ugly extreme lengths just to prove that we're right. And it's like, was it worth hurting somebody's feelings just so you could say that you were right and have the last word? Wow. Yeah, that's definitely very powerful and very common in our culture. I think that you raise a very good point with that. So in the five of swords, in uh, traditional tarot, or not traditional, but in uh, Ryder Smithwaite. For me, I get the sense of this very kind of cocky person and being very smug in their thoughts and uh, domineering and disrespectful. And I guess that plays into kind of how you uh, ended uh, discussing the Five of Swords in the Moon Void Tarot in the sense of the need to be right. Is that kind of what you were underlying, like this energy of it when you said that? Yes. Um, yeah, I feel like it's, um, it's about, you know, it can be a card about emotional manipulation. Mm -hmm. It can be a card about needing to have the last word and being right. Yeah, looking at the artwork of that too and filtering it through the uh, – shocker color so you have the light blue up there with this kind of gray in it so it's kind of like this dingy dusty ass throat chakra over top of the emotion so it's kind of saying putting the expression of that over other people's emotions so it's very kind of clearly articulated in that uh, i really like how you present that too and it thank you yeah, I'm, I'm gaining a lot from this. I guess the other aspect that comes up to me too is kind of looking at the orange of the boots. It's this uh, creating this sense of smugness based upon the need to be right as well. Hmm. And you know what? Sometimes when this comes up, this card, that's a huge, I feel like that's a great card for self-reflection um, it can be a little confrontational when you are reading for somebody else. Um, so make sure that you're presenting that and also checking the cards around that um, for more clarity and more guidance. A lot of times when I read for people, the message that comes out of this card is that um, it's time to speak up. You know, a lot of times, um, we don't say what we need because we're afraid of hurting somebody mm -hmm. or we're afraid of having a difficult conversation. So instead of saying the uncomfortable thing, then we internalize it. That's so important. People have this concept that, that they need to be brutally honest and that's not necessarily the case. You can be honest and when, especially when you step into the place of understanding that, honesty about something that's unpleasant or how you truly feel with somebody that you care about and means something to you is a lot more respectful and shows that you value them more than letting them kind of uh, continually hurt you or cross boundaries. And it also shows that you care about yourself 
and that you're not going to step into this pay, place of um, people pleasing and self sacrificing because that will set you up to hurt people more. I mean, hurt yourself more as well in the process. Uh, yeah, that's like the essence. I feel like those two elements are the essence of this card. And you know what? You really have to trust your own instincts on it to let you know which side of that spectrum are you on? Are you in the people pleasing and internalizing? Or are you going to extreme lengths to prove your, that you are right and have the last word and being brutally honest? Hmm. And how is that affecting your relationship with yourself and your relationship with other people? Yeah, those are definitely good questions for people to ask. Speaking of, of questions to ask people, I have a question for you. Um, and this is something that came up in my personal experience reading. And maybe it's something that other readers or people that are curious uh, about learning to read tarot, I'm sure it's something they'll encounter at some point. When you get difficult cards like this that you have to present to people, this is a two-part question, by the way. First off, what is your suggestion for approaching it um, in an honest but empathetic way? Um, you know what? Sometimes it's helpful to, when the card comes up, kind of like, sometimes I look at the person to see if they, what type of visceral reaction they get when they see it. Hmm. And sometimes I'll, I'll ask them, you know, how are you feeling when you see this image? Mm -hmm. And that kind of maybe opens up their vulnerability a little bit so that I can, you know, kind of work with them to see which side of that, of the coin are they on and where they need a little guidance. Hmm. I like that. And the second part of the question, this is actually based upon an experience that I've had. And I, I have experience with this circumstance today or that I, I've, I have experience with this circumstance, but today it kind of, it resonated with me differently and I feel that I, I'm okay with it, but it might help listeners. Um, when you get negative reviews or you get a couple negative reviews back to back and you feel that it's more of the people coming from a place of hurt because they don't want to hear the message, how do you deal with that on a personal level? Um, I feel like that if somebody gives you a negative review, I feel like the first instinct that anybody who is human is to take it personally and to feel like there's something wrong with us. Mm -hmm. But then it becomes an opportunity to lean into our own strength of self and of character and to realize that um, we're the space holders and we're the interpreter. And whether somebody chooses to um, take that message and run with it, or if they want to place blame, I think that's a reflection of them. Mm -hmm. People's behavior is always a reflection of themselves, not a reflection of you. Hmm. So don't allow yourself to be the messenger that's getting shot. Just deliver the message and understand you did what you were supposed to do and any of the collateral damages relative to the individual nothing to do with you personally. Correct. Hmm. And, and that also goes back to um, <clears throat> how when people that want to get readings, but aren't open. And sometimes the energy, sometimes the cards, and I think the longer you do it, the more you can like realize, like I'll pull a couple of cards and I'll be like, this has nothing. And I'll feel it. I'll say like, this has nothing to do with, what they are actually inquiring about and more to do with them trying to keep a wall up between us. Hmm. But and see, that's something that I just learned now because that might have been, um, had I had that knowledge previously, that might have been something that could have helped me navigate a couple issues like that um, that I encountered today. And now that I have that bit of wisdom, if I'm saying this doesn't seem like it lines up, I can step back. Um, and be like, maybe I'll just do the next couple cards and see what comes up. You know, um, so I don't, I'm going to use this as an example. And I, I don't know how many people are going to resonate with it because um, it's a tattoo example. But when you get a tattoo um, and you decide that you're going to do it and you, your artist, when they put the, um, 
the outline on you. Before they go in and start doing the artwork, they do the bloodlines. And basically it's these very fine lines that um, will make it so that they're not tracing the ink on your skin. They're tracing their own lines that they put in. So whenever I do a reading, I do like bloodlines. I'll always pull three cards first and um, that are almost like an icebreaker. Mm -hmm. And I always ask the same three questions. The first question is whoever I'm reading for and I'm trying to resonate with their energy. I always ask, where are they right now energetically? What's happening? What energy is around them at this very second? And I lay them face down. And the second card I pull is what are their thoughts? Because there's your higher self's energy and then there's your ego energy. And then I pull a card that's like a message from the universe about what I need to know and what I can say to them about those two things. So a lot of times something will, the first card will flip over and I'll be like, okay, this is the energy that's around you right now. How do you feel about it? And I flip that card over and it's an interesting dialogue that mm. sometimes kind of helps people open up into, okay, this is what we're doing. I like that. It gives you a snapshot of their personality so you can there navigate it with um, a little bit more awareness as opposed to going in blind. Yeah. It helps me out. It helps them out. It's, it's like, you know, um, like I said, an icebreaker. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, Sometimes it's like they're, they're nervous mm -hmm. and you can feel that nervous energy and you know, give yourself a break by not trying to break their wall down and exhausting your own energy. Mm. Just start out with, you know, a couple, it doesn't have to be three cards. It could just be like one icebreaker card, but I usually, I like things in threes. So I pull three over and, you know, say, this is where we're starting. And then usually that can kind of get the ball rolling and then I can pull more cards and do my readings. I really like that concept. I'm going to have to start implementing that because it really makes a lot of sense as a way to kind of transition into everything instead of like just starting to read and be like, Oh, you're totally fucked. Um, not that I say that to anybody like that, but <laughs> I have a little bit better table manners than that. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Speaking of icebreakers, um, why don't we transition into this card, the five of pentacles, because it has that kind of snowy ice vibe to it. Uh, um. And what does it mean to you? So the five of pentacles, um, it's always, like I said, it's, um, I feel like fives are like mini wheel of fortunes hmm. because it's that, it's that transition. Um, so the five of pentacles can be how you're feeling about your resources. You know, a lot of like a big keyword in this is lack. Hmm. and noticing and focusing on what you don't have mm -hmm. when what you really need to do is, and this is a huge, and don't hate me for saying this, but this is a huge piece of law of attraction and visualization <gasps> and manifestation. Yeah, I know. I'm just going to rip the bandaid off. <laughs> no, no. <good. laughs> but please hear me out. So a huge part of manifestation is, um, whatever you see in your current reality, a lot of people take that to be, this is where I'm at. And no matter what I do, I am still like broke and alone and like life sucks and blah, blah, blah. Cause you're looking at what you don't have mm -hmm. because it's not physically in front of you. And the essence of this card is that you have to remember that everything you're doing in this current reality hasn't manifested yet. Everything hmm. you can see that's tangible right now in front of you is a result of past manifestation. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a, a real call to action in the sense of changing your perception of what you have. I really, really like that. And mm -hmm. having faith and trust that the universe will always provide for you. You'll always have enough when you're on your right path. And 
if you focus on lack and you focus on what you don't have, you're only drawing more of that to you. Hmm. So if you focus, if you choose to see this card, it's like a little slap in the face of like, hey, you know what? You need to work on your abundance mindset. <laughs> oh, man, you're laying the law of attraction on thick. <laughs> I'm just being a trickster there. Um, honestly, what I'm going to say is kind of in line with law of attraction and all of that kind of stuff anyhow. One of the things that my mentors uh, has told me in regards to me wanting things in life and I say this through gritted teeth, uh, is if you aren't able to make do with what you have now, how can you ask for more? If you're not fully using what you have now, how can you ask for more? If you're not capable of like managing it, how can you ask for more? And I think when people really begin to understand that, that most people aren't fully utilizing what they do have already, it really changes everything because it's not that more things are going to help you. It's that by further, by maximizing what you have, you're capable of achieving more than you thought you could. Yes. That is so important. Wonderful point. Thank you. Um, and that's as close as I'll get to law of attraction. I'm just joking. I've been dabbling in it. So don't tell anybody. Don't tell me. I'm telling everybody. <laughs> but tying it into this card, it, it almost, and I know that this card doesn't represent it, but it's almost like one person is, um, you could, you, one could say that they perceive it this way. One person is so busy focusing on the cold that they're kind of stuck out there. The other person is focusing on kind of the gifts that are in the card. Cause to me, tying it to the whole faith concept as well, it kind of looks like gift of spirit or like a stained glass window of a church or, or some kind of spiritual center. It doesn't have to be a church specifically, but right. Um, one person having faith. No, it, it's a huge, like the faith and having faith in whatever you believe in. It doesn't have to be religion. Um, you know, I always say I have faith in the universe mm -hmm. um, that basically, you know, in the moon void tarot, it's a box on a windowsill with like a couple of pentacle, like five little pentacles in the box. The box looks pretty empty, but you know what? That box has five pentacles in it. So they, those are your blessings and your gifts and what you actually have. Hmm. So instead of thinking, Oh my God, like I only have five pentacles left. Like I'm broke. I would say I'm so grateful that I have these things. So when you get this card, it's changing, changing your outlook and really getting into a deep sense of gratitude because gratitude for what you already have attracts more to you. Hmm. Gratitude is one of those things too that I think some people forget this. Like people will say an attitude of gratitude. Gratitude is such an action word in the sense that how you live expresses your gratitude. And the more that you kind of practice gratitude, at least like you said, the more that you get from it, but the more you entrench yourself in, um, it's one of those things, like one of those principles that you can practice that will revolutionize your life. And it's something that has changed my life in a great way. And not to say that I don't fall into it, but if you're ever feeling down or like you're focusing on one thing, if you can do the simple practice of like writing out a gratitude list, it will be such an overwhelming experience. And this is just a, a very quick tangent. One of the uh, dark moments early on in my recovery, I was focusing on one particular problem and I was just like so wrapped up in it. And then I really stopped and I began to think of all the things that I had to be grateful for. And I can remember just like crying and being like, I've, I've never really perceived life this way in the sense that there's so many more things that I had to be thankful for than, you're thankful for that there actually are problems but most of the time people will get wrapped up in that one problem not on all the wonderful things going on exactly so i think that this card is really about taking a look at what you already have it's pentacles it's earth it's tangible hmm. so what do you already have you know okay so i want a new iphone wow 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 but i'm able i'm grateful that i have a phone at all that I'm able to communicate, that I'm able to listen to this podcast, um, that I'm connected. It's like, okay, how can you take the things that maybe need improving or you wish were better and being grateful that you have them at all and finding something wonderful about it? 
Mm. I think that um, it's really important to remember that the universe has its own sense of timing and you're going to get all of the things that you want (laughs) when you're ready for it. Because if Mm. the universe sent you exactly what you wanted right now, for whatever reason, you wouldn't be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important thing to, for people to remember really is that everything happens in divine timing and for divine reason. And um, there's lessons to be learned along the way to make you appreciate and value those things differently and rushing the process. It actually like rips yourself off of the whole experience. You're shortchanging yourself quite literally if you want it to happen before it's ready. Quite literally. And also you have to remember like this is also um, I feel really heavily in the fives, like in the traditional fives, other than the five of cups, there's always another person. There's other people in the cards. Hmm. So there's the fives have a lot of comparison. I like how you uh, point that out. Yeah, it really is. Especially in the five of, of pentacles. It's like the one person's cold, at least they can walk. And the, the dude that's on the crutches, it could be like, well, at least he still has two legs or could be a one legged person. So when you really begin to look at perspective of things, um, which it is definitely the shifts. Universal law. The universal law of, pers- of perspective. Hmm. Um, I think that you can be alone in your house. You can wake up in the morning and do your gratitude list and be flying high on universe vibes and everything's great. And then you go out and you can have an interaction with somebody and you're like, oh my God, they have my dream life. Like what the fuck? And then you fall right into this like whole cycle of lack and comparison Mm. and judgment. And then that's when you really have to remind yourself of divine timing and everybody's paths being different. And just because it seems like something came quickly to that person, there are things in your life that other people would kill for. That's super important to remember. I mean, especially if if listeners are in the United States, they have it better than I think 80% of the world's population just by default most of the time. Um, And I think we lose sight of that. I mean, even, even, even like, this is the last like little tidbit I'll add to it, but like even in the concept of being able to wake up in like a, a well state of mind, having had experiences where I wasn't even able to wake up mentally well at times because of body chemistry and stuff like that. Just the ability to wake up and kind of be present in reality is, is uh, something a lot, a lot, a lot of people take for granted. Yeah. I feel like this, that's, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving on to shift the energy of all of this because that got really deep at the end. I had to throw that in there. Um, No, but I'm glad you did. That's really important. And I think that that is going to help a lot of people. I think your story is really important, Ross. And I think it's wonderful how you've taken your dark night of the soul and really taken your power back and then sharing your gifts with other people. Hmm. Thank you very much. You've done the same thing in in a, a different way. So similar uh similar thing different approaches and different stories but very similar so give yourself some credit to give yourself a round of applause miss capone <laughs> thanks ross <laughs> you're welcome now um, let's talk about five of wands yep 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 what comes up to you on that one let's start with the moon void tarot five of wands so so wildly different than a rider weight smith or a lot of other Dex, I think. Um, Bring it. <laughs> all right, so you can see the back of her, and she's got her hair up in a bun, and she's got five things sticking out of her bun. She's got paintbrushes and pens and pencils. I love it. It really embodies the creativity of the wands, and it really says kind of creativity on the mind. One thing I want to add to it before you give your description of it, since it's your card, it makes me think of this um, Jack Kerouac quote 
my fault, my failure is not my passions, but my lack of control of them. And that's kind of where I see the conflict in there is in the conflict of so many different hobbies and interests and artistic expressions that you're not able to choose which way to express yourself. Exactly. Very well mm. put. Thank um, you. I think um, traditionally this card has like all those little boys hitting each other with sticks. And they're not hurting each other, but they're also not getting anything accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, I have a good friend. Her name is Mariah Simmons. I'm going to shout her out. She's an incredible tarot reader um, in Brooklyn that I do a lot of work with. Um, she calls this like the card of life jazz. Hmm. Life like, jazz. You're, you're busy kind of with no purpose, putting all your effort out, but not really getting any results. Hmm. So when this card comes up, I tell people, I'm like, you know, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the artist's way. I'm not. Oh, it's so good. You should totally do it. Um, so this woman wrote um, the artist's way, and it's um, a series of exercises to reconnect you with your creativity when you're blocked. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this card, because it's, again, it's a five, it's a transition card. Um, sometimes if you're feeling creatively blocked or you just need to get energy moving again, um, you need to like use misdirection and try a bunch of different mediums mm. because that way, at least you're taking some action and showing the universe that you're ready to change and to evolve and start new projects and you don't have to, you know, apply for a new job or, you know, start a whole revolution or something. It's like, you know what, if, if you have been showing up to your canvas to paint and nothing's happening, like go write in your journal, hmm. you know, or if you play, if you play music and nothing's coming to you, like go do something different. Try a I bunch of stuff because it's all creative. You just need to like activate that part of your brain in, in action. I really like that. It hits home on a personal level because lately I've kind of been, um, my material focus has been conflict, conflicting with each, with each other on one sense. So there's that combative force, but then also my creativity has been lacking because I've been so um, busy fighting at these material creation fires. Something else that I want to add to it as well, that advice of, about trying different things and instilling new things to kind of reinvigorate your creativity as well. That whole principle translates to relationships as well, especially with the element of fire. Like yeah. adding that spark would be trying new things. And in our culture, especially because we're kind of a, a throw it away and get a new one culture, like a lot of relationships are probably mendable if people would just take the time to try different stuff and instead of continually trying shit that doesn't work. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. You can be creative in more ways than one. It's not just about personal expression either. You can express, um, you can add creativity to pretty much any interaction, I guess. I think that's such a wonderful point that you bring up that, um, again, like if you're looking at wands as a relationship, um, a lot of times people think that the initial attraction and that chemistry fades when you reach deeper levels of intimacy and um, they get bored and they're not challenged and they think it's time like to move on. And like you said, it's like, no, that's actually not the case at all. It's coming up with creative solutions and trying something different and being open to realizing that you don't need to start fresh. It just needs some fresh energy. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that's so important. And I think that that really, um, there's a quote that I heard that really struck me. And I can't remember who said it, but it was something to the effect of um, like true love is falling in love with the same person over and over again. Hmm. You know, that's beautiful. It, it's really beautiful in our relationships and in love. There's always a season. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a season where it's hot and heavy and intense. And then there's going to be a season where it's something different and honoring yourself and your own needs. And then also working in, you know, 
in tandem with your partner. Hmm. Yeah, talking about this like aspect of the relationship thing too, when they go into those seasons, this is kind of off the topic of the five of wands, but it's on topic of this tangent that we're on. Do you find that it is more about kind of, or at least 50-50 about going in yourself and resolving the conflict that you're finding within the relationship, that it's not specifically the other person, that at least 50% of the problem rests with the individual who's having the problem with the other person? No, that is 100% accurate. Um, I think that it's important if you find yourself feeling unfulfilled in your relationship, we're, as a society, very quick to blame our partners. Like, oh, well, he's not a good listener or she's like distracted or whatever the case may be. Um, I think the first thing is to really sit down and reflect on what's missing. Hmm. And then think about how can you give it to yourself? Um, I don't know how deep into that you want to go, but um, you know, a lot of times with couples, like sometimes like the physical part fizzles out and we really look to our partner to be, to be that for us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times because you want to have that connection with somebody and it's not there, the more you want it, actually the more um, pressure it puts on the situation. Hmm. And so if that is the case, then I would say then it's time to look at your own relationship with what physical pleasure is for you and figure out different ways that you can have that you can strengthen that relationship with yourself i think and, that's a really good point because a lot of times when you do that and you're like okay i'm gonna take the pressure off my partner to make me happy and i'm gonna figure out what i need to make me happy and i'm gonna engage in that by myself then a lot of times it's the weirdest thing but it picks right back up with your partner and they'll they'll become the initiator hmm I have a couple of things that I want to add to that whole topic of things. Uh, earlier on in something else I was doing, I kind of mentioned the original meaning of the wedding ring and it's, it used to represent two whole individuals coming together. And so they're forming this greater concept and it's kind of ties into being this whole individual and not necessarily needing to get everything from the other person. And then the other aspect of that is, having been on both ends of the of relationships where there was pressure one way or another, um, really understanding that intimacy is so much more than sex or like physical intimacy, that there's a huge level of intimacy and in honoring the other person with where they're at emotionally or where they're at with that physical expression that that really is a defining moment of a partnership. And if it can't weather the honoring of those needs based upon this physical thing that probably isn't right for you anyhow um or you need to learn the lesson i should say at the very least uh, that's my last little tidbit on the tangent no it was really great um i think that especially with tarot reading when you read for other people um a lot of people are coming most i find the most is about their relationships and about their money and their finances mm -hmm. Those are really the two things that seem to be the greatest um, point of concern. Also, because those are two areas that no matter how much work we do, we can all backslide into seeking external validation. Mm. That's you know, a really good way to put that. We look at how much money we're bringing in and what our job is that defines our worth. And then we look at our worth in a different way, our emotional and our attractiveness and just a different kind of side of the same coin of our worth ref based on how our partners are reacting to us. So a lot of times if your partner seems distant or not interested or not making time, um, then you're like, you know, a part of you wants to blame them, but really what that is, is you're like, okay, I feel rejected. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, rejection is a very heavy thing to deal with, but most often it's us rejecting ourselves. It usually has nothing to do with the other person. Um, And that's why I think tarot is such an important tool to have in your self-care practice because it's a really safe place to look at where you can be in a better relationship with yourself. I absolutely agree. Real quick, before we do the bullet points, I'm going to ask you a Stephanie Capone um, tarot reading tip for people giving other people love readings. What is one Stephanie Capone tip about love readings? Um, Thank you for asking, Ross. I feel like this is something that I've said kind of the same message in every card in one way or the other. The message is always the same. It's um, meeting yourself where you are and using your tarot spread and using your tarot cards to kind of help you take responsibility for your own em- emotional well being mm-hmm. so that you are prepared to receive. A lot of times we think that a relationship fixes us and a relationship mm. completes us, but there's something that we need to give more to ourselves in order to feel as worthy as we actually are. Hmm. Um, And then it's, you know, and then it's like, okay, then when you get that person like coming in, you have to be able to accept them. You know, a Hmm. lot of people are really uncomfortable receiving. That is an understatement. I feel like, yeah, absolutely. I found that to be a hundred percent true. I feel sorry to, continue right over the top of you, but that's part of the whole year of 2019 is it's an empress year, but also empress is reduced down from a 12. So I don't want to jump too far ahead, but it's a hangman year. So if you had a dialogue between the hanged man and the empress, you have waiting and you have receiving. Hmm. So how can, and then it's a three, so it's your solar plexus. So how can you be fully in your personal power to be soft enough to wait for the right divine timing and then be open to receive it when it comes. I wish I could like project a fire emoji into audio somehow. I don't know what that would be. So just picture a fire emoji. (laughs) 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 Um, That was awesome. Thank you. So the bullet points of this Thank you, like, for the awesome, awesome uh, stuff there. What are the bullet points for what we talked about today? Um, So when we think about the Hierophant, I think that it's tradition, and it's also breaking tradition, seeking your own path of knowledge, and also sharing it. Hmm. One thing that I want to bring up, did we hit the astrological sign associated with it? We did not. Thank you for reminding me. You um, got it. I feel like I've I've talked so much. I'm sorry. Um, You're fine. Was feeling feeling all the feels today. Um, so the Hierophant is associated with Taurus, mm-hmm. which is really interesting to me because um, obviously, like uh, Taurus is stable and dependable, reliable, stubborn. They prefer to be in positions of authority. And like I said, they're very traditional. Hmm. Um, You know, you're not going to change their mind. I feel like you were talking about me up until the point when you said traditional. Now I'm not taking it personally. I don't feel personally attacked anymore. Okay, good. (laughs) But it's weird because, I mean, and I just actually did a blog post about the Hierophant and Taurus and how you can kind of, put those two cards together because I think a lot of people because of the time of year Taurus season falls in it's very fertile it's very luscious you know when I think of Taurus I think about it's a it's tangible earth you know it's ruled by Venus so you would definitely think more Empress vibes than Hierophant vibes Hmm. because I mean this is like a pretty unsexy card and I think of Taurus as like the sexiest sign when is Taurus season, by the way? I'm, You're in I, it. Okay, I'm, I'm not good at astrology. 
the time is now, my friend. Um, yeah, we're, we just got into it. I think we've been in it for like a week. What's today today? May 1st. Okay. Yeah. So we've only been in tourist season for like a week or so, and then we'll be in it until, um, the third week of May. Okay. So think about what grounded earth means for you at this time. Like a lot of, like I said before, you can always do astrology readings with tarot cards by, you know, pulling out, you know, maybe pull out the empress and sit her next to your Hierophant and say, what do I need to know about love? What do I need to learn about receptivity? Hmm. And also what can I share? I like that concept a lot. Um, very, very well said. So moving into the bullet points for the, uh, the pips or the minors, where do you want to start? Um, so I think just the main bullet point overall is that fives are about change and transition and looking at things differently. So hmm. when you're looking at the five of pentacles you're looking at your resources and your finances and what you have in a different way. So changing your perspective of lack into gratitude. Hmm. And with the five of swords, um, your thoughts and your words, either speaking up for yourself instead of internalizing and hurting yourself or um, look at how, what's important to you do you need to be right all the time and mm. how the things that you say might hurt other people? Um, five of cups, I would say changing from looking at past experiences of pain and emotional trauma um, and to find that it's time for healing and looking at those upright cups as the lessons that you've learned and that you were, your heart was open to experience the deep levels of love and emotion. And so you know that you can experience it again. Um, and then the five of wands is um, a different approach, hmm. whether it's your creative projects or your relationships, trying new avenues and switching up the energy. Very, very, very well said. So next week, we're going to be covering the lovers and the sixes. Um, what would be your like little teaser for that? Um, I think that it's really interesting that traditionally the lovers card when, you know, in like the Marseille deck and stuff like that, I think that it was called like the choice. Hmm. And it was like, or traditionally it was like a man picture choosing between two women. And then mm. that evolved into the Rider Waite Smith where it was a man and a woman between an angel um, picking divine love and um, like human love. So it's like that, like, like sacred love versus like, um, I don't like lower octave, like, lust if you will i took it a different way hopefully i remember this when we kind of get into it but the way that i i'm just gonna bring it up now so in case i i do forget then i'll shut up we can end the episode <laughs> i could talk to you all day um but the thing that comes up to me is i almost wonder in in some cultures or traditions they have it where people give up their right to seek kind of romantic love in order to follow the spiritual path and i almost wonder if it's like that sacrifice but the thing that's really beautiful about it is if you make the sacrifice of pursuing the material um love in the sense of finding it in another partner it's very transient and temporary and there's actually a profound beauty in that of kind of giving up this great grand gift for this one person i feel like that is a really unique and interesting perspective and i will counter you on also, the earthly union of two people can bring about a transcendent experience. Hi-oh. Hi-oh. I, I think that's a good place to end for today. Um, 
I can't wait to talk it out next week. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you as well, Stephanie. And if anybody else wants to get engaged in this conversation, you can reach out to Stephanie or myself on Instagram. You can shoot one of us an email. Uh, my email is staff at spiritualphoenixstudios.com. Stephanie, what is an email where they can reach you at? You guys can reach me at um, Stephanie, S-T-F-A-N-I-E, at moonvoidtarot.com. Or you can um, hit me up on Instagram. I actually have um, a link tree bio or a link tree link in my bio that will take you to my website where you can purchase the deck on either my site or Etsy. Um, it has a direct link to the podcast right there. And um, also uh, your link to your May sexoscopes, which just came up. I don't know if you guys know, I write um, a monthly horoscope column for Dame, which is a very conscious sex toy company. And um, I write about sex and intimacy and love. Oh, very, very awesome. Yeah. I hope everybody checks that out and that they enjoy as much of your other creations as they enjoy this. And uh, I really look forward into diving into the lovers uh, with you next week. Have a blessed day. Thank you for listening. If you love this show, one kind review goes a long way. If you have a question or comment you'd like read on air, please send your email to staff at spiritualphoenixstudios.com or use the link in the show notes.